Dating Eve August Fulcher. Hi, hello and welcome. It's John O'Sullivan from the Irish Pagan School. And we are back with another community question to answer. Um, we do this from time to time. We kind of connect out with our communities in our social media spaces or in the school or via the email list. And um, if you're not on any of those things, check the description below. You'll find links to kind of connect with it, the great resources that we send out. Um, but then also it gives you an opportunity to engage in, in that way. And like you might find that other people are asking the same questions and, you know, all of these kind of opportunities to provide answers or to give perspectives benefit all of us in very many different ways. So um, the couple of questions I have to answer here today come from Gabriella. And Gabriella was someone who was joining us regularly for the Live at Five sessions that we were hosting during the the main two year period of, of COVID, even though COVID is ongoing. Um, anyway, we're not going to get into a, a rant about that. But I've got this just a couple of brief questions here from Gabriella. Um, has my deity abandoned me or are they on vacation? Is it common for the Morrigan and the rest of the Irish deities to foster out their people? Whilst journeying, if I can't see anything, is it still effective? Is there an optimal amount of journeys a week or a minimum? How do I get back on again after having let my practice slide? And what can I offer which is not money or cost very little? I'm currently not super rich in money. How can I start a practice to get off the ground? Okay. Um, these are very, very common questions. They're ones that like we do kind of come across time and again. And um, so that what I would always say is that it's, it's, good to be aware that these questions are, are are not common as in banal or mundane or anything like that at all they're there's something that many people experience or have experiences with and so by understanding that there is that commonality of experience when it comes to these kind of questions it can help us feel less disconnected or less alone when on our spiritual growth or our path um so the first really one to answer there about feeling abandoned or disconnected from deity i did do a video on that it's in our youtube there and it's called distance with deity um and so it can happen from time to time i have experienced it many times myself working for and with the dagda um but it's important to understand that like these these are entities in their own right. These are, are beings of their own kind of purpose with their own agendas, with their own kind of timelines and their own kind of things going on outside of ourselves or irrespective of ourselves or our awareness of them. So just because we aren't currently experiencing something doesn't mean that they're not pursuing their own agenda or their own work. I have found it time and again that, you know, the data will be there if I need them, but if I don't need them for a particular thing, then, you know, it's, it's, we're still close in our connection, our relationship. I'm still investing in that. I still have a commitment to fulfill for that, but I don't need them kind of sitting over my shoulder every time or all of the time, every day. I appreciate it. I'm very, very grateful for those moments when it does happen, but it's a way of kind of decentering myself from him, you know? So I have, I'm, I'm the center for me, for myself, for my life, but I don't expect or demand him to be constantly paying attention to me or constantly fulfilling or like on with me all of the time and um, because that in, isn't balanced in forms of relationship so it is understandable that two people will have their own spaces to do their own individual things but that means when they do come back together and um, there is a sharing or a bonding or a connection and a, a transfer of information and experience that is a benefit so um Again, I would recommend anyone check out that Distance with Deity video in YouTube. I probably articulate it a little bit better there. Um, the next question there, is it common for the Morrigan and the rest of the Irish deities to foster out their people? Um, it's not uncommon. Um, I wouldn't say, oh, yeah, yeah, it's completely normal, happens all at a particular time, because it does depend on what kind of relationship you have here. So I do go into this one in another video. Um, again, People have asked these questions before, but there's a, a video on the YouTube, which is like working with multiple deities. So take a few minutes, maybe watch that one, because being pagan involves polytheism. And so it's possible to have multiple working relationships with multiple different deities. Now, the specific fostering out or the specific kind of having a chief or a lead relationship or a prime connection with a deity and them 
informing or introducing or connecting or changing the relationship with other deities can happen. I've, I've met a number of different people who have been put on kind of learning hiatus for a certain degree from the Morrigan with other deities. And, you know, it is usually for a mutually beneficial circumstance for the individual to learn more outside of their particular field, but then also to fulfill some growth or some practice that makes them more useful in their connection or their bond and their relationship with the Morrigan. So again, it's not uncommon um, to have that happen, but I wouldn't expect that to be happening all of the time. It is about the individual and their personal relationship with the Morrigan, um, which would then steer how that would actually grow. So again, working with multiple deities, there's a video on that and exploring that idea of the multiple relationships and multiple connections, um, but then also some of the risks and the dangers about that. We don't want to cherry pick or dim, 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 no, not that's not the word. Um, we don't want to minimize the, a particular deity down to an aspect of them fulfilling something for our own needs, because again, that is not balanced in regards to relationship. Um, but again, I recommend checking out that other video. Um, the next thing really is is a really really great question, and it's worth almost worth kind of doing this video just to answer this one, and it is. Uh, whilst journeying, if I can't see anything, is it still effective? So what we're talking about when we mentioned the journeying practice is the, the kind of guided meditation practice that was developed by Laura O'Brien, my partner at the Irish Pagan School. And it started as her own kind of way of moving into a meditative position and then exploring herself and then exploring her connection to the collective unconscious or the Irish other world or through the collective unconscious into the Irish other world. Um, there is a, a third class on that in the Irish pagan school. There's even a beginner's journeying, like a completely free beginner's journeying to kind of start there. So we do get questions and it's like, okay, well, I didn't experience anything or like, you know, it was, I did, I, I fell asleep partway through, like um, I did a video on this one. It's like, am I broken if I can't meditate? Um, you will find that as well. But the answer in that one really isn't, no, you're not broken. Like there is a practice and this is a skill and it is a skill that takes time to build up and takes time to develop. And so though someone may have their first experience with a journey and it might be fairly revelatory straight away, that might be because they had unfinished business or they had something that was pending pending resolution or pending kind of centering within their growth and by having their first journey it allows the mind to step aside from ego step aside from self and explore deeper into the self and through that you know the messages come or this held back or this damned kind of as in like a river dam it's like a dam is like holding stuff back and that dam then opens and stuff begins to flow so that can be very impactful when we begin a journeying practice, when we take our first few guided meditations. Um, but over time, like, and especially when we build up the habit, when we build up the skill, we no longer have this backlog of stuff waiting to get through. So it's not large, like, you know, bursts of information or bursts of download. It's an ongoing process, an ongoing flow or stream of progression with the meditation. So that means that, you might not always have a message or an experience or a connection with another world guide or guardian or God. You know, it might actually just be taking the time to be in the journey space, be in the journey mental space for yourself. So is it still effective? The answer is yes. It, um, from a neurological science point of view, it has been shown that daily meditation practices can actually help refresh, restore and rebuild um, our, our brain pathways you know so this kind of clearing out or bleeding out of of cortisol which is a, a stress circumstance which builds up in our mind brains which is supposed to be there to help us with our flight fight flight flee instincts to keep us alive and survive but it's not so we're not supposed to be in a state of constant cortisol flow because that is harmful long term like it and a, a from a scientific point of view, a buildup of cortisol in the body can actually have very negative effects from a, like the body literally poisoning itself. And the same with adrenaline, like overbuilding up a, a you know use of adrenaline or 
too much adrenaline in the body can have negative effects long term. So it is shown that a meditative practice, even five minutes of meditation a day, can lower, significantly lower the amount of these neurological chemicals that our brain is building up as we go through the rest of our day. So when we talk about effectiveness, like even if your guided journey doesn't go beyond the beach, doesn't go anywhere outside of self, or even if it's down to taking five minutes to be centered within yourself, focusing on your breath, eyes closed, and just being in the darkness behind your eyes. Like you don't need to go through a full vision vision expert exploration or spiritual experience for it to have some positive effect on you your body your mental health your emotional well-being so journeying i would absolutely say is something that should be done and should be considered irrespective of you know not seeing stuff outside or not getting any ongoing messages you know you know what they say no news is good news you know sometimes if you're doing the right work, doing the, the right connection with your, with them for your deity. They don't need to, you know, test step in and clarify things. Um, like I love the Morrigan. She has my love and my respect, but I don't want her turning up every five minutes to critique exactly what I'm doing all of the time, you know, and the same way to Dagda. I absolutely love the Dagda. I have all of the time for the Dagda every single day. It's the job, it's the work I do, but it's a pleasure as well. I still don't want them kind of popping into my consciousness every five minutes and, and pointing at something or whatever. So it is about the healthy boundaries and healthy, healthy balances. And so having a journey where it is just you for yourself, exploring yourself and connecting with you and just for you can be a very healthy and a very effective thing. So, you know, I would definitely recommend some form of journey practice and so that leads us into the next question what is the optimal optimal amount of journeys a week or a minimum i think it's important to kind of consider what journeying is for each of us for individuals and um, for some people it really just to get get to it like you know without kind of talking around it too much a journey or meditation practice needs to form part of your own daily routines and habits or weekly routines and habits or monthly routines and habits. It is about building up something that is a benefit to yourself for yourself. And I would not say that there is an exact optimum, like you have to do this or you have to define this or you must achieve X number of, because that can also be counterproductive. You know, the moment you start setting, you must med you must have a guided journey. You or not even a guide. You just must you do your journey practice every day. Suddenly you miss a day, then you miss two days. You know, then you go again, then you miss another day, and we're human beings. Sometimes it then becomes a chore. It becomes a burden. It becomes, you know, uh, a, something we are mean to ourselves about because we're not achieving against this arbitrary goal that we have set for ourselves so i'm speaking from experience on that one what i would say is try and embrace a journey or meditation practice as something that you're gifting yourself as something that you are doing for you whatever whether you connect to a deity or the other world outside of the, within those moments or not you know define what works for you you know, if starting once a week, but then make that time for yourself. And that's something you need to be able to be sure of and to define your boundaries on your personal boundaries and say, listen, this is my slot when I do this. And then that needs to become something that's precious to you. That needs to be some, become something that you want for yourself, which means that you won't skip it. You know, or you'll say, listen, I need to make arrangements or listen, I won't be able to meet your friend or obligation or whatever till after five o'clock because I'm I have I'm busy till then with X number of minutes or time frame or whatever for my meditation. Um, be it in the morning, afternoon, evening. So there is no minimum must achieve here, right? This tool, because that's what it is, is something that can help you grow and expand in your spiritual growth with yourself as much as with deities, gods, guides, guardians. So 
reframing the focus on that as a gift to self, you know, and as that old saying goes, you can't have time unless you make time. So I would be hesitant to say you must achieve or set a set a minimum. What I would say is that, you know, gift yourself the time and say, listen, this is what I want for myself. This is what I expect for myself. But then also be gentle with it. Like if you commit to I'm going to meditate every day for a week and you miss a day. OK, but just don't miss two days because that's how you can build up a habit. And according to the neurological science around this as well, if you do something consistently for 30 days in a row, it becomes a habit. You literally create neurological pathways in your brain, which define the use and the purpose, which connect then to this. So if you're going to be creating a, a brain by highway or like motorway in some way for your journey, then make it a pleasant one. You know, build it based on, you know, joy and experience and happiness as opposed to obligation, requirement and chore, you know, which means that you're, you will define things a lot easier. It will become easier for you and long for now. I'm not, I am saying you, but I mean, everyone for all of us, myself included. Um, it's easier to commit to that and to go back to that. If it's built from that place of I'm gifting this to me and this is a pleasure or an experience or a joy. So there is no minimum. There is no maximum. Like, you know, the only way to define an optimum is by doing it for yourself and finding what works. And, you know, again, there is value, even if you're not going into a full experience or spiritual growth experience, taking the time for yourself to just be with yourself. Chemically speaking, neurologically speaking, biologically speaking, there are so many benefits to having a daily meditation practice. And that's what the guided journeys or guided journey work is in its core. Um, so, how do I get back on again after having let my practice slide? Turn up. Like that's that's the, the core element of it. And talking about habits, if you build something as a habit, then it's easier to connect back into it. So it might take a bit more energy or effort in the beginning to actually define or create the neurological highway to be the 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 pathway for your habit. Um but once you have that done, then it's easier to get back into it. You know, you've defined exactly, you know, okay, well, it's it's Thursday morning. That's when I give myself 10, 15 minutes to do my meditation. And so you fall out of habits. It's not going well. Next time it comes around to a Thursday, oh, it's a Thursday. I'll just give it a shot again, you know? So it's, we are all of us complex creatures. And our society is complex and the pressures that kind of can't come upon us can be difficult. Um, uh, especially if we have some form of neurodivergence as well, it can be, it's not just as simple as, oh, we'll just do it. <laughs> that, if, that doesn't work. If someone tells me to, oh, well, just do it. Then, you know, contrary or like stubborn Leo will be like, no, I just won't. Even if it's in my own best interest, you've told me to do it. So I just won't do it now until I want to do it or I'm ready to do it. But I think it's just important to define it for yourself and to turn up, you know? So I, for example, the, the dank that has his coffee there on the altar, that's based on every time I open a new cream. And sometimes we're making daily coffees here. Other times I might have a coffee once or twice a week, you know, in which case it goes from, you know, him maybe getting two or three coffees in a week to just maybe getting one coffee in a week. But I've built the trigger, I've built the, the habit of giving him his coffee on that first cream as soon as I open a cream for the first time. And so by defining little steps or defining that relationship or stepping stones in that relationship at any particular point, then that is how it makes it easier to get back into or to build back onto those steps and stages because there is some particular trigger that will define the next action you know so for example someone asks me a question you know the irish tradition of bardic nature is that the question must be answered in whatever way i can eventually get to answer the question now sometimes i'm in a headspace where i can rock out a couple of videos on the back once and just answer a whole lot of questions other times i'm i'm not and so it needs to be okay but there needs to be some practice there needs to be some habit to 
allow me to get back into it. And that's kind of what I'm doing now as well. So um, turning up, define what turning up is for yourself, how it looks for you, how it works for you. Because again, all of this process, like to, it's about living a spiritual existence. It's not about having a spirituality that is separate from your life. You know, it's about bringing those things close together that you live a spiritual life. You know, I know some people who refer to themselves in not even just pagan, but in various other spiritualities, they only define themselves based on a feast day. You know, they go to mass for Lent or to, you know, Christmas mass for as a Catholic, and that's their one and done for the year. They don't exactly then live the values of being Christian throughout the rest of the time frame. I know many pagans who are like, you know, you know, they 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 turn up for a good pagan show or like they turn up for a large thing, but they don't exactly live an ongoing pagan practice. And that can be difficult for many number, any number of different reasons. But it is about doing whatever we can to bring our spirituality close to our daily life. So that we're walking in our relationships, we're walking in our right relationships and in our practices in a healthy, growing way. So it's not something that, again, we have to overcome some burden or some trigger because it's a chore, because that's something that this should be easy. And if it's not easy, then either you're not supposed to be doing it or you're doing it wrong. (laughs) So there needs to be an awareness that those things kind of build up over time. And to get back onto the practice, you just have to turn up for that relationship with yourself and then with your deity or whatever, like um, God, guide, guardian, spirit you're working with. Because that's that's really what it actually is. You define where how that relationship works, you know, and all you got to do is then keep doing it. So... Um, the next thing then, the last thing is about offerings. Um, we actually did an entire class on offerings in the Irish Pagan School for those who are interested in, in taking an offerings class. Um, the where and where, what, what is an offering, why, how, etc. But in this instance, Gabrielle was wondering, what can I offer which is not money or costs very little? And I think it's it's important to understand what actually is money. Um, money is something that is an agreement or a bond it is money is energy it's something that you're able to people have an agreement over that it has a particular value and then they exchange that value for goods and services so if you redefine the thing that has value then something of value doesn't actually have to be money time can be very valuable you know um and gifting your time or volunteering your time to help others or to assist others um, or to assist your community or is, is a way of making an offering. I know many people who similar to this question, like I don't have a lot of money. I can't go buy the fancy bottle or the X food or the whatever thing. I don't have an altar space I can work with, you know, and we say, okay, well, you know, gift your time and said, look at the culture that you're learning from the the nation or the spirituality that you're growing your practice from and then gift time into that dukas.ie the national folklore collection is is a great resource of knowledge from irish culture but also knowledge of irish spirituality and stuff but a lot of it is collected from photographs or imaged kind of school kids copy books where they've captured these stories from their elderly people lots of chunks of that aren't transcribed and so a number of people have actually asked us and Laura recommended it. Like, you know, if you want to get, make an offering that will be of service to your community, but also to Ireland and the Irish culture and the Irish community, that'd be a great way to do it. And so they set themselves, again, they set themselves a goal to go in and to do a transcription a week or to do a couple of transcriptions, you know, every few days or whatever. And so that is an offering of time. That is an offering of energy that then benefits everyone down the road because the work is done in the transcribing. So there are other things that can be done around that, those areas as well. I know many people working with various deities who are called to advocacy work. Again, it's not about 
like getting paid or it's not about like just giving money into a charity. It's about turning up and advocating for that charity or for that cause or for that change. And um, when there was a change in sovereignty in or in the monarchy in our next door neighbor, the Great Britain, um, there was a lot of advocacy put forward. A lot of people suggested now is a time of change. Now is a time for anyone doing energy work or advocacy work to be louder about it. They don't get paid for that. They don't kind of, you know, personally benefit from that in some ways. In fact, some ways it personally costs them. But it is a sacrifice and an offering of that energy and that effort that can be linked to a spiritual practice, that can be connected to I'm doing this for my community or on behalf of for my community on behalf of my deity. I know people who have actually taken up going to the gym for themselves. They make an offering to themselves on behalf of their deity which is where the boot camp with the Bive t-shirt in Ian and Otter actually came from, you know? So it's that, well, you know, the Bive is expecting more of me. So I'm going to dedicate my drive for personal fitness to that connection, to that kind of deity work and deity growth. So there are many different ways in which to build. And it is this idea of value. So what is a value? What do you define as value and what can you give as value? And that can be as complex of, as advocacy work. It could be as, you know, involved as transcription work, or it could be as simple as sharing a video in social media, leaving a review on a class you read or a book you bought, um, especially like pagan authors in certain fields. You know, if you go in and leave comments or reviews, that can really have an ongoing effect on the visibility of their content. Now, this isn't a plug for you to just you know, go in and comment on all my videos. That's that's not the point here. The point is that there are many people out there who could benefit from the information that is being provided. And in order to get that information in front of people, it does need to get the right kind of support and the right kind of energy behind it. And if money is energy, an intrinsic agreement then your time and your effort is also energy and putting your energy in comments, reviews, likes, subscribes, you know, especially for important information. Or if you know someone who could benefit from another video or a conversation, share it to them, tag them to it, like, you know, connect them onto it because that then doesn't just benefit the content creator. It benefits the person receiving that information. It helps them get further on on their, their road. And, it is about doing that consciously. So when we talk about offerings, you know, it's looking outside of this, looking outside of money, but then considering money as just a, an expression of value. So what other things have value and how can you provide value or give value or offer value to your community, to your culture, to the culture that you're learning and growing from? You know, that is something that is maybe a different way to look at the idea of offerings. And if you feel inclined, leave a comment on this video, <laughs> you know, leave a comment on the book. Make sure you go in and like, you know, when you get the emails from the Irish Pagan School after taking a class and it says, oh, did you like the class? Would you like to leave a review? You know, it's not just us fishing for compliments or fishing for like updates and information that is literally designed to help people, help other people find the right content for them. It's a thing called social proof. And so if you have a positive experience with the classes taught by John O'Sullivan at the Irish Pagan School, and you put a comment on there saying, oh, I experienced this or I enjoyed this or this part of it really sang to me, that then can help the next person along make a decision if that's for them or not. That is an offering. That is effort and it is en energy but it's not something that is intrinsically down to finance or money or coinage in any way, shape or form. So building a healthy practice around that and changing the view of connection to offering as energy, not energy, energy of value, not just, you know, paper coinage or, well, it's not paper anymore. It's like cotton, co cotton notes and metal coinage. So, um, 
I hope that has answered all the questions. I believe it's answered all the questions. I know I have left multiple mentions to other videos there in the YouTube. I will try and find those and put the comments, put them in the comment below, or at least link to the YouTube page where you can just go and find all the rest of the videos there as well. So until next time, look after yourself, take care of yourself.